Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here for such an important and timely conversation. I would also like to welcome the members of our TMU executive group, our panelists and our moderator. Thank you all so much for being here. It's an honor to have you here this evening. So before I begin with our introductions, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge the land in which this university situates itself, um, as well as the place where we have the privilege to be able to freely have this conversation. So if you don't already know, Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and to respect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. So now with all that being said, it's important to understand that as we embark on this conversation about STEM, that we acknowledge the fact that STEM education and research has had a history of excluding and subsequently harming Indigenous peoples. We have a responsibility to recognize these truths and to educate ourselves on how we can support them and most importantly, take action. This is something that surely everyone can do um, and I certainly will continue to try and do the same. So my name is Crystal Henry Matthew and I'm a graduate student here at TMU, soon to be alumnus as I do walk across the stage next week uh, to earn my degree in environmental <laughs> science and that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to earn my degree in uh, my master's degree in environmental applied science and management. I'm also the founder of Black Women in STEM, which is an initiative that helps to guide and inspire uh, Black youth as they embark on their journeys to a career in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. In this initiative, I also publish a virtual magazine which features amazing and accomplished Black women in STEM from across the globe not only to highlight some of the amazing work that they're doing, but also to pinpoint them as mentors for youth, which is something that I felt was missing during my, my STEM journey to date. Growing up, everyone knew me as the soccer player. I played competitive soccer from the age of eight and had the honor to represent my university during my undergraduate career. But a soccer career beyond university was never a thought in my mind. I always knew that I wanted to pursue a career in STEM but my teachers didn't always see that dream as realistic. Some teachers didn't see me as more than an athlete and some were clear in saying that a girl like me wouldn't be welcome in these spaces. While these words are wrong and they perpetuate the exact problem that we're trying to dismantle, they were right about one thing, women and particularly black women are greatly underrepresented in STEM. Like me, many young girls have been told that their dreams are too big or unrealistic uh, and that fact has always been clear in every classroom that I've walked in. The unbalanced male to female ratio has always been evident. And I graduated from McMaster University as the only black student in my program that year. So it's for this reason that I am excited to have a role in this conversation today, because I know how important it is to provide opportunities for women in STEM to have a voice, share their accomplishments, but to also make notice of the barriers that they've come across in their journey so that we can intentionally dismantle them. Now, amplifying the voices of women in STEM may seem like a difficult segue into the introduction of President Mohamed Lashemi, but I promise you it is not. And tonight we will touch on what we may expect from men when it comes to addressing challenges for women in STEM. For now, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce TMU President and Vice Chancellor Mohamed Lashemi former Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Architectural Science and an advocate for diversity and inclusion in STEM. In 2016, when Dr. Lashemi was installed as the university's ninth president and vice chancellor, knowing that education can transform lives, he announced the creation of a new fund to improve access to post-secondary education known as the President's Award to Champion Equity or PACE. The awards aim at improving access to TMU for underrepresented groups, including women in STEM. Dr. Lashemi has made equity and inclusion defining values here at TMU, situating them at the center of the university's strategic vision. We are very pleased to have him here with us tonight to kick off the evening. So please join me in welcoming Dr. President Mohamed Lashemi.
Thank you very much, Kirsten. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, congratulating you next week at your uh, graduation ceremony. It's exciting, and thank you so much for uh, the introduction. We are talking about uh, imbalance in STEM. Since you are a soccer player, there's also an issue in soccer and FIFA <laughs> with uh, women versus men that we should address, but that's not the subject or the theme of uh, tonight's uh, debate. I'm honored to be here tonight and to share this stage, even for a few uh, moments with such distinguished uh, guests. Uh, the issue of gender imbalance in STEM discipline is uh, close to my heart. As uh, an educator, and you mentioned uh, my pre previous role as the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Engineering Science and Architecture and then uh, Faculty of Engineering and Architecture Science, but also as a, a parent. Uh, so uh, I uh, know firsthand the uh, challenges faced in creating safe, welcoming, and equitable opportunities for women in science, technology, and engineering. Uh, TMU, Toronto Metropolitan University, is deeply committed to uh, fostering diversity, inclusion, and opportunities in STEM. And this is one of the reasons that you mentioned uh, when I uh, started my job, uh, I announced at my first worthy installation uh, ceremony, the creation of a scholarship uh, program to help people deal with barriers and uh, and their represented groups, including women in, in STEM. And I'm pleased that after uh, eight years, we were able to uh, fund, do a fundraising effort where we reach $8 million that is going to be, or has been uh, to support those and their group or underserved uh, groups. So it's very important for us as a university to uh, challenge the status quo and do a better job to help uh, those different uh, uh, groups. And I'm also uh, proud to have a, a vibrant and uh, growing community of women in STEM here at TMU. And I hope that uh, their accomplishments continue to inspire us all. From my experience, all universities in the country have been trying to address the gender imbalance uh, issue, but unfortunately results have not easy to come by. Progress has been slow, and I'm sure the uh, uh, panelists will talk about it. However, I see uh, from my own personal experience, two approaches that have demonstrated potential for success. The first is to engage female students very early in explaining the human aspects and the impacts of STEM disciplines. Because if we engage them early on and it's not end of high school, I can tell you we have a lot of people who are keen to do something to change the way that we do in society. And I have seen many examples of people that uh, I know in the system who were really introduced to uh, STEM early on, or at least prepare them for STEM disciplines. So we must work to work uh, to, uh, to make sure young female students understand how STEM discipline contribute to better lives for people, because that's a big motivation for many. My second point comes from my perspective as a father, and it has uh, to do with uh, role models. I have three daughters, and I don't necessarily talk to them about my own example as an engineer, and you can, some of you see that uh, uh, I'm also, I have uh, my ring here, but also to expose them early on to real, female role models and get the information directly from them because if they hear it from me as a, as a man, they don't necessarily get the message clear 
from the perspective of somebody who is in the field or somebody who is a student who is also female like them. So um, I have three daughters that uh, decided to uh, pursue three different streams in higher education. Uh, my youngest was uh, always passionate about math from early on in middle school, even from uh, primary school. So her choice of high school subjects line up well with further education in uh, STEM. As she was deciding about her career direction, she uh, asked to meet with people who can tell her the story. And I know that uh, one of the things that uh, we have here, a great team, I see Nika there, of uh, women professionals that are always there to help those young individuals. She came, I think, when she was grade 10, meeting with a number of our engineering, female engineering students, but also she wanted to talk to people who are already in the industry. And I can tell you that her decision was based on those conversations, not with conversation that she had with her father. Because it's very important to have people who can tell her their own uh, stories and why they want to go through this path. She uh, engaged in many of those uh, conversations to uh, find out more and uh, to her that exposure to role models, both, as I said, students and professionals contributed to her decision to make engineering her first course of study. And uh, she's now third year engineering student here. She seems very happy especially after surviving the first year or two. Now she's telling me that I can feel engineering more than in first year. And then those who are the dean is here, uh, who are very close to the curriculum. Of course, when you get to that point, you, uh, you feel the uh, profession and the importance of understanding what we uh, do. So uh, as we hear from our distinguished panelists this evening, we know there are challenges and barriers that women still face every day. It is our shared responsibility to dismantle these barriers and to create an environment where everyone can thrive. Tonight's event is a step towards greater awareness, understanding, and action. Please enjoy the, uh, the evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the audience. All the best. Thank you, President Lashemi. Um, and if anyone would like to learn more about supporting the President's uh, Awards to Champion Equity for Women in STEM, I encourage you to seek out Emma Grant or Andrea Russell, who are both with us tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, Penny Wise. As the president of 3M Canada, Penny has led that company's journey to improve equitable access to STEM education in the country. She holds an MBA from New York University and brings over 20 years of global branding and marketing experience to her role. Penny has been responsible for several award-winning marketing transformation projects at 3M, including the successful launch of 3M's global tagline, 3M Science Applied to Life. Outside of 3M, Penny is co-chair of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce's Council for Women's Advocacy, which helps bring the perspective of women to national policy and drive meaningful action. She is also a board member for the Business Council of Canada. In 2021, she established a series of 3M STEM Talk workshops, bringing together Canadian industry leaders to explore barriers and actionable solutions to equitable access to STEM education for underrepresented communities. As a result, 3M is working with partners to look at the way that STEM is taught and accessed across the country in Canadian schools, and they are rallying role models, champions, and leaders to join the drive to break down barriers. 
In 2022, Penny was deservingly recognized as one of the WXN's top 100 powerful women in Canada. And evidently, she is using that power for good. Penny shares my conviction that together as a community, we can change the face of STEM fields. So please join me in welcoming Penny Wise. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you very much for that very lovely introduction. <laughs> Honored. Uh, um, I wish my kids could hear that sometimes. <laughs> and um, Crystal, I just wanted to say thank you to you for the work that you've done and your perseverance and the work that you do to advancing Black women in STEM and for being a champion. It's about being more than a role model. It's about being a champion and lifting people up and setting them on the right path and giving them opportunities. So thank you so much for what you do. Uh, in 2021, in its 2021 report card, the Conference Board of Canada gave Canada a C on innovation. And obviously that's an average and you're gonna have some provinces that even scored below that. Correcting this problem needs to start with our earliest potential innovators and future-proofing Canada and an economy for growth for the future means that we need to remove barriers to equitable STEM education now. Uh, we've talked a lot about women in the workforce. Women represent 47, almost 50% of Canada's workforce, but only 25% of the people who are employed in STEM careers. Crystal is putting women on the cover of her STEM magazine, but we continue to see few women in the top jobs in our research labs, hospitals, engineering, architectural firms, or in scientific journals, let alone on the covers. At 3M, as a science company that is known for innovation, creating equitable access to STEM is an issue that we care very deeply about. We know that the best ideas come when you bring together diverse opinions, diverse ideas, and, you bring, and that's how you solve really big problems. STEM literacy and skills are the bedrock of STEM-based innovation, and that will be the source of our many of the solutions that we're going to solve many of the world's greatest problems. The problems we face today, from climate change to health equity, from manufacturing to infrastructure. So removing these barriers needs to be a priority, not only for traditionally science-led companies like us, but all companies. So in a recent study that 3M completed on barriers to STEM in Canada in underrepresented groups, almost 70% of Canadians believe that our STEM workforce would benefit from diverse perspectives, would drive more innovative ideas, and would further enable Canadian businesses, the academic community, and the broader industry to collectively come together to help solve those biggest problems. Now the question becomes, how do we get there? We know we need to. So that's what we're here to discuss this evening. Businesses need to create clear career pathways, invite diverse voices into decision-making and create champions for young people in STEM. Just final on 3M, for our part, we established a 3M Advocacy Fund, which provides financial support to organizations and people who are removing hidden barriers and creating solutions to address, 3Ms, or to address STEM equity. But we know that's just a start and it really is about actions. It's not just about words. Although tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit and use some words. We're gonna probe more deeply into the issues around STEM equity. And we have assembled a group of exceptionally talented and accomplished women representing a range of experiences in STEM fields. And I'm gonna read just to make sure I get everything right here. <laughs> Dr. Emily Agard has a PhD in immunology from the University of Toronto. She is, in current, she is currently the director of TMU Sci Exchange, where she is focused on making science accessible, engaging, and inclusive of all groups. Dr. Roxana Suring is an assistant professor in analytical environmental chemistry at TMU. Okay, that's a <laughs> mouthful. She has acted as policy advisor to the Netherlands delegation for the OSPAR Offshore Industry Committee regarding offshore chemicals and as advisor to the UK Ministry of Defense regarding potentially polluting shipwrecks. She has also written for and edited the children's journal, Frontiers for Young Minds. Alice Thomas is the chief architect and digital technology officer at Sun Life. A trailblazer and champion for the advancement of women in tech, Alice is, pa is a passionate supporter of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and continues to carve out inroads for future tech and talent. Dr. Imogen Ko is a professor of chemistry and biology and the founding dean of the Faculty of Science at TMU. She is also an affiliate scientist at St. Michael's Hospital where her research group studies drug transporters. 
Imogen has published widely on inclusive leadership, misogyny in science, and the need for intentional policy around EDI-infused organizational culture. You see why I have to read the words to make sure I get it right. <laughs> Just not going to get there. And last but certainly not least, Carla Avis Birch is the Chief Planning Officer at Metrolinx. A civil engineering graduate from TMU, Carla is deeply passionate about fostering inclusive workplaces. She has served as the president of the Women in Transportation Seminars Toronto Area Chapter and was appointed by Infrastructure Canada to the Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority Board of Directors to oversee the construction of the Gordie Howe Bridge. That's amazing. <laughs> so thank you to all of our panelists here tonight. We've got a lot of ground to cover and you're gonna keep me honest about timing. So we have a couple of different sets of questions. So we're gonna start, um, we're gonna start with uh, this um, question of, there's a really big disparity between women and men in the STEM economy. We said 40% of our population or working population is women, but only 25% in STEM are women. How do we open the doors for more young women to enter the world of STEM? I'm gonna start with Dr. Eggard, but of course people jump in as we go. Dr. Eggard, your, your thoughts. Okay, well, I know that a lot of us have lots of things to, to, to say about this topic. So I'll start from the beginning and even address the issue of the door itself. Uh, women know where the doors are. Women's are fully, women are fully capable of opening doors. So really the key is what's on the other side of the door. That environment, is it toxic? Is it misogynistic? The issue isn't that women don't have the capability, can't find where they're going, but a lot of the time, the issue is how the environment is once they get there. So imagine if we have this room and there's belonging of the people who are in this room, and then there's a woman, she shouldn't have to be outside knocking on the door waiting for someone to open it for her. The whole idea is that uh, representation, diversity should be such that it is very easy for the woman to open it her own self. Unless you're at a five-star hotel and the concierge is opening the door. <laughs> then maybe you can have the door open for you. So that, that's, that's one of the things that I always like to talk about. It's not so much that we can't open the door, we don't know where the door is. It's just that sometimes when the women get in a particular environment, it's so toxic that she goes running out the door. So right. that's, that's... And so what do you think, maybe for the other panelists, if it's not about opening the door, because I think that's a really great, like a really powerful point, is what are some of the things inside that environment that are making it toxic that when you open the door, you instantly let it close because you don't want to see what's inside? And, and how do we, how might we address some of those? And anyone want to, Roxana? Um, yeah, maybe actually, and again, taking it even a, a step further back, because I think this environment or this feeling of, I am not, I don't belong this is not my place, can happen obviously in university, can happen in school, but can happen very early on already. And I think one of the things we're seeing there is that there's still often an environment where young women and girls particularly are being told this is not your path, um, this is not for you. And where, for example, many achievements that could be highlighted as, you know, as was said, for example, um, you know, role models as people who did open those doors are then not in popular culture, not recognized. Um, I mean, right now, even with the recent Oppenheimer movie, why was Lisa Meitner or not in there? You know, the brain behind the theory of nuclear fission, why was she ignored? She's an incredibly important part of the story. She wasn't in there. And so it, we keep seeing, even up to this point, where, where stories like that are being ignored. Um, and I think this can start, definitely we have a lot to do in university, but this can start already or has to start in our homes, where, for example, the conversations with fathers, actually. I absolutely agree that probably the conversations that you enabled with then you know, female engineers, for example, got your daughter to choose that path but she might have never even felt comfortable to reach to that point if it hadn't been for conversations like this. So I think fathers, men have a huge role in being allies, advocates, and those people who lift up their daughters, brothers, you know? This needs to be something that isn't women having to, you know, break open the doors. It needs to also be, um, you know, coming from an environment where they already had 
the feeling of, oh yeah, that's a path for me. I think that is a really terrific point as well, because as you think about it, it's, um, you know, as you look at it, young girls, like young children are naturally curious and they have a scientific mind from a very early age. And it really is what are the, what are the, what actions happen or what kind of guidance do they get or what, how do they keep that world open instead of closing the aperture? And I think you're right, family and parents are a really important uh, uh, component of that success. Other, well, yeah, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> um, I, think, I think one of the areas that we have to talk about is, you know, we, we get them into university, they get the education, they go through, you know, all the environmental barriers, they get it and they're looking for a job. And then companies like us, you know, I work for a progressive company that attracts a lot of women. We, we have changed how we attract women in tech. And just, just talking about a couple of things that have helped. If you just look at how we do our job descriptions, our job postings, a lot of those postings were written by men for men. It does not attract female candidates. So rewriting those with a lens of, it's not a coding job. You're going to do a lot more than that. You're going to work with clients. You're going to impact the bottom line. You're going to affect how this company runs. Those are small things, but you attract women to apply. And then when they do apply, when you put a whole bunch of men on the panel, they just go, okay, enough. I'm, I'm not coming here anymore. So what, we, what we've done differently is we've put a diverse slate of panel interviews, especially during COVID, it's all been online. So panel interviews have been very effective, men and women. So that when they see people that look like them interviewing them, they feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are small things, but it makes a difference. And when they do come in the door, you assign a buddy, mm -hmm. maybe a female buddy that can partner with them and help them through the ropes. There's a lot that can be done um, to attract and bring them in the door. And the whole discussion of retention, that's, that's probably another conversation. You know, how do you retain them once you get them in the door, <laughs> right? Alice, I think that I, I wanna hold the thought about this idea of jobs and what jobs look like for STEM because I think that's also another piece, but Imogen and... Oh, um, yeah, I guess just um, uh, reinforcing what my colleagues have said. I, I, I do find it, as somebody who's worked in this field for a couple of decades now, I do find it very odd that scientists and engineers who are scientists and engineers don't actually look to data and evidence and scholarship and research <laughs> to inform what their actions are. So, you know, there's a, often a, like a feeling of what's going to work, which we keep doing over and over again. And actually it doesn't work because it's actually not grounded in any research or scholarship. So why don't we actually use research and scholarship to inform our actions? That might be a useful place to start. Um, definitely raise boys as feminists. Uh, there's just no way around the fact that we have to um, stop with the deficit model that somehow we have to fix girls and women. There's nothing wrong with girls and women. They're awesome. They're brilliant. They're full of ideas and creativity. What we have to really address is culture and context. And so media is definitely highly complicit. Uh, you just have to go, Penny and I have talked about, you just have to go into your local Joe Fresh and look at the t-shirts that are marketed to little girls. They've got unicorns and be nice and stuff and the t-shirts marketed to boys have got dinosaurs and robots on them and if we could just stop gender stereotyping kids all together because it disenfranchises boys as much as girls that would have a wholesale generational change so we can all do that we can all contribute to shifting the kind of cultural narrative about who belongs you know in different fields what a scientist or an engineer looks like do we see them up on the screen? Do we see them represented? Do they look like me? I had a student last year do an honors thesis project on our textbooks and do the textbook re representations in the sciences match our student ID? We can look at the data. Shockingly, but not surprisingly, not at all. Is there a match in our textbooks? And even worse, the representation for some demographics was only within the context of disease and dirty water and you know an illness and that kind of thing. So we have a lot of you know different places that we can look to actually shifting the cultural environment to create one that says, yeah, you look, you know, you belong here, we want you in here, we want you to come, we want you to be involved, you're valuable. Um, there are people who you know look like you, but we need to we need people to take responsibility for you know, for the environment and who are the people that have the power and the privilege to do that, they're not typically women. Right. And they might be white women, 
you know, in which case there's a responsibility for white women to do a lot more. But really, we've got to get away from this deficit model and we've got to get towards holding people accountable and making people more responsible for shifting the culture and making the environments inclusive. I hadn't even thought about textbooks. That's a really yeah. powerful and potent example when you're in a student. Carla, maybe I'm going to just change up the question just a little bit. So we start at an answer and everything. Oh, do you have an answer? Okay, I don't want to stop you from your answer. But kind of part B of the question that we had about opening doors was that we don't really necessarily always, and you've had a really successful career. And, and so I want to add, it's about careers and how do you help get creative in people understanding that you can have a creative idea, a creative career in science, in STEM, that it's not all about being in a lab. Like if you love being in a lab, that's fantastic, but there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts on how do you encourage, how do you open that up? How do you open some of those doors to what else could it be besides in the lab? Well, for me, it was trying to marry the two, right? So I knew I liked to do things with my hands, but I knew I loved math. And trying to figure out what that blend looked like was a path that I had to figure out on my own. And so I think, you know, I have a challenge for all, uh, you know, the leaders in the room uh, to really look at how do we actually do a national campaign? How do we go on and explain that STEM jobs are not necessarily about building the bridge mm -hmm. or designing a beam or doing research in a lab? Those are all great, but what it also could mean for me in particular, working at Metrolinx in the transit industry, I had no idea that that's where I would land. I knew for sure I wasn't gonna be in a room designing a beam, but I had no idea that I would be working in a transit industry. And what that happens is, is I think somebody spoke to that a little bit earlier, is that it connects you with the work that you're doing to impact on people's lives. When you look at the job descriptions and the items that you were talking about, don't want to stereotype, but women usually are looking for something that's going to give back to their community, that's going to give them a sense of, 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 purpose. of purpose, right? And so uh, there are so many, not only organizations, but areas in the STEM field in which you can actually bring that to life, but you never hear about that. So all the job fairs that are actually happening, all the high school uh, career fairs that are happening, they always talk about the, the academics of the STEM program and not the potential of how that STEM education could bring you to life uh, in a job in the future. So for me, coming back full around, I would say, you gotta run this like a business. At the end of the day, I'm a data-driven person. We like data. We talk about data. STEM is all about data. We should be running your businesses around getting more women into the STEM industry like a business. I'm very fortunate in my organization, we have a key performance indicator, a KPI. Every year we are measuring how we have a 50-50 balance in terms of the workforce, in terms of women and men. And that is just the beginning of creating a diverse and inclusive uh, organization overall. The numbers don't lie. You know, you have a diversity of thought when you actually are pulling from the best full pool of the candidates available for you, not just a part of them. And then the second thing I would say, and last on this particular question, is leadership. We need leadership. We need to be unapologetic around standing up and saying, these are the KPIs we need to work towards. This is the national campaign I think I need. This is the data that proves that this is gonna be successful for the business. It's good business overall. Awesome, I think mm -hmm. that's fantastic. So, you know, finding, um finding roles that aren't in the lab, just as a person, my, my daughter's 26. She has an undergraduate degree in biochemistry, biotechnology. She worked in a lab for a year, hated it, <laughs> went back and got a business certificate. And now she works in an advertising agency that specializes in healthcare and pharmacy. So she still uses the science every day, but boy, that would have been helpful to her three or four years earlier to understand what else you could do out there in the world. And, and, uh, and make a difference from that perspective. Alice, I, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna come back to Alice because from a Sun Life perspective, obviously you're attracting employees. You want to, how do you help share the kinds of careers? Like you talked about some of the ways you build job descriptions and engage women, but our and thoughts on, on how we get creative in, in showing what the opportunities are for women in different roles and, and the creativity that's there. Yeah, I mean, we use social media like everybody else does, but I think one of the ones that pre-COVID, <laughs> A lot of visits to universities, a lot of spending time at events like hackathons, um, you know, sponsoring things like Women Hack, where women come and talking about 
different jobs in technology. It's not just about coding, right? And this is something that we, it's almost like a tagline. IT is not coding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of other things, whether it's a project manager, business analysis, you know, you're an architect, there's just so many roles. And one of the things that I think we've been very successful at doing is bringing some of our female women in tech. And I've got a few here that I hear from Sun Life, but grab your hand guys. No, There's a bunch yeah. here. Um, they are in different parts of our organization and technology. And, and when you bring people like that to the university and students meet them, their vision of this male technical guy coding in the background somewhere in a corner is totally demystified because they see this young person who's like full of energy and she's talking about creating user interfaces for our mobile app. And all of a sudden they're interested. Sign me up, I wanna join your team. I think there, you have to do deliberate things. And I, I really like what you said, Carla, about measuring. You've gotta measure, you've gotta have KPIs, you've gotta measure them periodically because if you don't measure, you don't know. It's just conjecture at the end right. of the day. Right. So Roxana, I wanted to just ask you a, a question to follow up on your comment. You talked about the family life and at home and, and that's a strong part of the environment. What kinds of messages should we be giving to our daughters, to our sons in home when, when they're young about science and the role of science in STEM and what they should be thinking about? Like how do we help them capture them earlier so that we're not losing people along the way? Yeah, and I think this actually, it sort of fits a little bit with this conversation as well because I, I very much agree that I think so both from a narrative that we often have in, I think, at home, but also particularly whenever we are going into any type of learning environment, um, there's this narrative about STEM that it's this body of knowledge that you're being presented with that is built on the works of these old dudes with weird hair <laughs> um, <laughs> from a couple of hundred years ago, right? And you should somehow, if you want to be in the space, aspire to be like that. I'm still saying, you know, now as a prof in chemistry, I'm really struggling with the beard. You know? <laughs> so, but, but this is a problem when we teach it this way. And I think it is a problem, not only for women and girls, it's a problem for boys as well. It's a problem for generally attracting creative minds, right? Because a creative mind who wants to find something out, who wants to discover, who wants to figure out how the world works, and then looks at people like that, will think, well, what do I have to do with that? Hmm. And how am I contributing to this? How do I even have an option still? Because all of the exercises I'm given are basically stuff that we know the answer to, mm -hmm. and they are just asking me to now figure out how to do it the way they did it back when, right? So I think there needs to be, in education actually, early on, a shift towards highlighting, well, what is the thing yet that you can actually discover, and what are the questions you can ask that make a difference? So I work in contaminant research, right? So for me, my questions I ask every day with my students are, what are chemicals that we are using every day? How do they get into the environment and what do they do when they get there? And so those are questions I then ask to undergraduate students. What do you think? And the creative ideas that they come up with, with questions to us, with design for you know, experiments they would like to do, with you know, specific research problems they want to address, be that on the undergraduate level, later graduate obviously, but on the undergraduate level is actually wonderful to see. And um, I think sparks a lot of that creative energy. Awesome. So I know we're gonna, I got, I got a question for Imogen and Emily. Uh, just so kind of where do men fit into the challenge? And you started touching on it, Imogen, about where men fit in, how, what can we do with messaging for you know, men and boys to ensure that we get to an inclusive culture. So you talked a little bit about Joe Fresh, which I know you and I like to talk about, but <laughs> other thoughts and, and, and pieces that but, you would bring to the table. And then same for you, Emily. Yeah, so, I mean, I think this is a, a part that we really haven't done a very good job of in Canada uh, is calling men in, both calling them in and saying, you're part of the solution mm -hmm. um, and also holding them accountable. So you're part of the solution, but you're also part of the problem. And here are some strategies 
um, in order to actually help uh, you know, figure out this, this particular challenge that we have. And so um, we really need to do something. Uh, we need to do a lot more around healthy masculinities. There is a you know, well-established kind of bro tech culture. Um, there is engineering frosh culture, which is weird and it can be very exclusionary. I mean, I know there's been mm. a lot of work done on that. Um, but we really need male leaders, we need tech leaders to say, if you don't understand or you don't have these core competencies in what inclusive environments and inclusive design actually means, you're not going to get a job. So we need to ensure that particularly male leaders are kind of upskilled, that they step up and they speak to these issues. They say that it's professional development. These are core competencies that all of our students need to have. And, uh, and all young men and, and all men are involved in creating uh, inclusive, creative, um, supportive environments and, and, and provide training and skills to achieve that. Um, but calling people in and saying, we all have a responsibility, it's on all of us. Um, it's not this deficit model that has been so kind of persistent for so long. So really calling men in and, and then upskilling them, I would say. Just before we get to you, Emily, I just, Carla, from the business perspective, obviously, you're, what's, what do you think that role is for including men and boys and, and building on that? No, I would agree 100%. I mean, I think it's a partnership here, right? We're all working together. We're humans working together, and we need to figure out how to respect and work with humans. I said, in, in my business at the boardroom table or in different industries, we do a lot of construction. You may have heard of a few construction <laughs> It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> Transit is freedom. It's gonna get you everywhere that you need to Not go. Yet. But, but yeah. it will, and there is, but the point is we're on construction sites. There were a lot of environments where it doesn't feel um, inviting, I would say. Um, but what we really need to do is help the water cooler talk go away, right? It's when we're not around, it's when they're with their buddies, or it's when, you know, you kind of move away from what the right thing to say at a, a boardroom table it is, or a meeting is, or in an email, you have the time to craft it. It also side little comments. We got to hold people accountable at that moment. Those are the areas where it gets a little insidious and it festers and it feels like, well, it's just the way it's always going to be. Yeah. So to me in the business world, it's a really a bit behind the curtains where we actually have to do the work. And I agree hundred percent. We're partners in this. Emily. That's basically what I was oh. talking about. <laughs> talking about the, all those microaggressions and just having men as allies. And, and I really like that point. It's not, if you're pro-woman, you're not anti-men. That's not what right. it's all about. It's about us working together and having that respect and calling out. I find that even for myself, it's a lot easier for me to stick up for someone else. Often when I get the comments yeah. that kind of make me go, what yeah. did you just say? And then I'm just stunned. And then later on, I think of that brilliant clap back yes. that would have worked in the moment, <laughs> but I'm just, and I just keep my mouth shut because I don't want to be, you know, the angry black woman in the room. So I just, the stereotypical angry yeah. black woman in the room. Yeah. We do have reasons to be yeah. angry, but that's a whole topic for another day. We have reasons to be angry. But, um, but that, that idea of allyship and, and us working together, and it's not, and, and, and going back to what Alice was saying too, just having that different mindset in terms of interviews, in terms of what you're looking for, what's valued, um, a lot of when I look back on a lot of my colleagues that we went to grad school, more males are in this typical mm -hmm. research biotech. But a lot of my female friends, none of them are unemployed. None of them are doing things that they settled for because they weren't good enough for the lab. They went on and found lots of creative things. They're consultants, they're directors of science outreach. They're, um, <laughs> they're doing various nice things. Plugs. Yeah. <laughs> they're, um, they're doing different things. So I think that whole idea of that community and um, just, just being respectful. For, I know that's a weird concept now in this climate, but um, I think, yeah. <laughs> Penny, I just wanted to raise a comment yeah. about mm -hmm. mentorship and sponsorship. This is really important as, as some of the young women here graduate and start working for big companies. A lot of men feel uncomfortable mentoring women. This has not changed, by the way, in many years that I've been in the industry. Yes. We need to get more men comfortable to mentor women. And mentoring is, you know, kind of being a coach, being someone to help you navigate. Women tend to reach out to women, which is great, by the way. It's awesome. But hey, women reaching out only to women doesn't help our career. 
because we don't know all the rules of the game. Hey, I've been in this industry 30 years. I still don't know the rules of the game. That the rules of the game were made, made by men or men. So unless we engage men as mentors, we are not going to go anywhere. So I think that's one thing. And men have to be comfortable. And I think there's a comment made about training and supporting men in that. The other one is the role of a sponsor, which is mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. This is a person that speaks about you when you're not there. This is a person that, you know, thinks about you from a career perspective. Oh, you know, Mary should be the next, you know, director of our team because she's awesome and speaks behind you. And it doesn't require this discomfort of having to meet Mary for lunch or, you know, things that men feel uncomfortable with. It requires really taking ownership for coaching and helping and develop women in their career to have, you know, long-term aspirations. So the role of a mentor, a sponsor has got to be broader than women in the workplace. Women for women is not enough. Mm -hmm. This is really a partnership that's got to be broader. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I like that. And we're going to finish there because we're going to take questions from the audience. I think championing is also really Absolutely. important because it is an active participation. And I think every single one of us in, who has a long, had a longer career, we can remember a time in our career where someone was a champion for us or sponsored us or lifted us up or gave us an opportunity that we might not have had. And so it's also important to make sure that we are championing others as well as sponsoring and mentoring. So. So now I'm going to turn it over to, I don't know who's running the Q and A. Are you, oh, I see a microphone there. So, okay. So questions from the audience. Thank you. So um, I'm no, covering this for On the Record, person, which yeah. is the, the TMU um, journalism run by students. Um, and I was really interested in this. So I'm not in STEM. I'm not <laughs> anything like that. But I wanted to come to because I thought it was an important conversation. And my main question is, um, I think it was Dr. Imogen, you brought up the fact that, you know, institutions kind of portray, you know, like scientists, people in STEM roles, masculine, white men, things of that nature. So how do you, as someone who works in an institution, find a way to kind of break these barriers and you know, um, allow for a type of inclusion that may ne not necessarily be there from the get-go? Um, I was just talking to someone who just graduated and she was one of the only women in her graduating class besides another female. So I was just curious to how you as a professor or a team you professor can go about that. I know that's like a really direct question. That's a great question because I think part of this is what are the pragmatic things we can do, right? So, okay. well, I mean, coming back to data, I would say um, we have here really good data on our student demographics. So, if you look at the Faculty of Science, we can tell what the demographics are for gender binary in all of our programs. And if you look at biomedical sciences, it's 75 percent female. But if you look at math or, or medical physics, it's very much skewed the other way. So we can look at um, we can look at who we are. First thing to do is always to understand who are you, what do we look like, um, and really um, and why is that, and then start to design kind of um, interventions that are um, uh, maybe discipline specific or maybe program specific, um, and those can be a whole variety of things. So it's there's no single um, one thing that can be done, but there are lots that you, we, we need a sort of systems thinking approach, which is for the physical sciences and engineering, there are these things that we could do. And in you know, the life sciences, we might say, well, why do the numbers look this way? Why does the student population clearly does not look like the faculty? Why is that? And how are we going about our hiring? Are we doing inclusive hiring? Because we know what that looks like. A ton of data, Sonia Kang and, and Sarah Kaplan at U of T have done lots and lots of data, uh, research on CVs and you know, whitewashing names and that kind of thing. So we can use a lot of the research that's out there to inform actions um, and design actions that are evidence-based and data-driven and, and our best practices. And then the really important thing is to monitor those and see what the outcomes are. And it could be could be a year, six months, a year, whatever whatever the measure is. And then um, and then it's iterative. We go back. So I always like the sort of al algorithm, which is awareness. We've got a problem to education. What do we know about it? To actions, using the education to inform our actions to outcomes, and then continually kind of revisiting that particular algorithm. So I think there are lots of things we can do. It's time, energy, money. We have to set it as a priority, which is 
challenge. Lots of universities say very grand things about their you know, commitment to EDI, but do they put resources behind it? Not always. So, um, so it's complex and it's long-term, but there are definitely things that we can do and we should be doing and we could do better. Thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe um, from my perspective as well, because I think these are really important points. And I think there is there's the institutional level of that where it is about, you know, okay, how do we, you know, allocate resources? How do we allocate also resources, particularly for hiring, for equitable hiring? Um, but I think there's also the things that can be done in every single class and that should be done in every single class where there's representation, for example, where, you know, when we look at textbooks, and we see, well, okay, this is what's represented in the textbooks. Well, how good is this textbook, okay? Do we really need this? Or how can we augment this with other types of information? And so there's, there's sometimes small things. Like, so for example, I started having an undergraduate in my undergraduate chemistry class. I, I start every class with um, hero chemists of public health because it's for public health students. Um, and so in those heroes, I specifically feature black women, um, you know, or also, you know, basically other members of the BIPOC community, um, but really highlighting the achievements of those and highlighting also where they haven't been recognized before. Um, and I've had a lot of feedback from students that they found that really powerful. Is that gonna get them to, to suddenly switch to science? Probably not, but hopefully it made them feel a bit more welcome in this class. <laughs> you know, what's interesting there is that that is what representation does. Mm -hmm. So you have the right representation at all levels of uh, the industry, and then you just start making different choices because it's really not about talking about it. It's about doing the thing, right? So you really just take the action and mm -hmm. just do it. Do something about it, right? Kind of put people in positions where they are ultimately wouldn't have known they need to be there. Feature people in your in your uh, in your media story that otherwise people wouldn't go looking for. Just make it part of the natural fabric of what we're looking at, and it's not this extra thing on the side, right? It's not a yeah. special day in March. It's not a, <laughs> a it's not a thing, yeah. right? It's yeah. just part of a natural way of pulling from a pool of talent uh, that we are in abundance of. Another question over here. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Fatma. I'm a recent uh, graduate of the health, and, health service management program. Um, my question is, so I am great in chemistry and biology, or I was great in chemistry and biology in high school, but my physics was not, like I didn't have good marks. Um, and now, instead of going into epidemiology for my master's, um, one of the reasons why I attended this session is because I'm thinking of going into STEM. What advice would you give me? Advice. Go for it. Yeah, don't <laughs> let your past dictate your future. Absolutely. Do it. <laughs> so, so, and I would say, find yourself a sponsor, find yourself a champion, find yourself a mentor, build your team. So I always give this advice, particularly to young people and particularly to young people who maybe don't feel that they're welcome. You build your team and that's gonna change over time. You, you rely on near peers. So somebody who maybe is five years ahead of you in the system, you, you, help, you get them to help you navigate. Um, you really uh, learn how to, to self-advocate um, and you, uh, you, you really tap into the network. And so the network that can support you, you've got your team, it's close by, sponsor, champion, mentor, it can be all sorts of different people, will change over time. Um, but then there's a broader network that I think it can be very helpful to stay connected to that can kind of get you through some of those tough times maybe, or just be there for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have to be STEM people, but it's a broader, it might be, or it could be, but it, it's a broader network of support. And it might be, I mean, there's some interesting research out there that says, um, for young black women in STEM, they're more likely to persist in STEM if they're really well connected to their faith community. So being a member of the church, your church can be really kind of help to ground you and get you through tough times. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a member of, of the queer community, then really being connected into that community. So I think those are the kinds of things that when you're not the dominant demographic or when you're not the person who looks like a scientist, those are the kinds of strategies that can be helpful to 
um, to, to uh, helpful in persistence and resilience and that kind of thing. If I could just add to that, in that whole find your team, yeah. they don't always have to be formal relationships. Yeah. So sometimes it is you're just gaining information. Sometimes you're being in the same space and listening to them. Sometimes you're picking up an article or a book. Sometimes it's a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, so you know you you may not have formal relationships in every one of those roles, but you definitely want to build a team to know who is advocating for me, who can I go to for advice, uh, and who can I talk to uh, to just learn from. Can I can I say one? Of course. Um, and so and the other thing is to be really clear, and um, and I think we're not clear enough about this that there is significant power and privilege in STEM. So there's this idea, this science identity that we're it's objective and unemotional and analytical. It's not. It's science is done by scientists and engineers, well, and yeah. so who well, yeah. who are just as biased. They're human. They're flawed, which is why humans are awesome as well, rich and flawed and diverse and challenging and all of those kinds of things. But that means that science and engineering also have systems of oppression. They have biases in them. They have structural barriers. And so understanding a little bit about that can be helpful. The hidden curriculum mm -hmm. is a huge issue, yes. huge issue. Um, and we don't talk about the hidden curriculum nearly. That was what I was gonna say was yeah. you have to, yeah, you need the help to navigate the hidden curriculum. So that even though you talk about physics not being your strength, and I'm with you on that, uh, <laughs> there, there are ways to move beyond that and get through that and do well. And but you need to under but you need that team to help you get there through the hidden curriculum pieces of it. I've got a third question here, and then we'll try to take two more before we uh, close off for the evening. Hello, uh, my name is Rituja. Uh, I have completed my master's in aerospace engineering in uh, 2020 from DMU, and I'm really grateful to have access to such a great panel today. My question comes from a place of curiosity. Uh, once women are in the door of corporate culture, they have jobs. Um, do we have to battle uh, the internal battle of, you know, are we a, you know, inclusive hire? Are we hired as just because I'm a woman with some qualifications? Do I have to just do my job or go beyond to prove that I'm worth the job that I'm hired for? Does this battle uh, exist in the corporate culture? And since you've had such overachieving careers, I would like to know your opinions on this. Thank like you. <laughs> I, I can go. Um, congratulations, by the way, on, yeah, your, that's a, that's a, on your degree. Yep. And, uh, you need to be you when you start working. Forget what you look like, forget your ethnicity. I think, I think one of the things we have to be very careful about projecting is the fact that you earned the right to be in that job. You deserved it, you got it, now just do a really good job. And I think what's important here also is, I always say in my career, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I wasn't very good at it, I'll be honest. I was, I was a terrible coder. Know your limitations, switch. I went into project management, I went into management very early in my career, but you have to know what you're good at and be really good at it. And people will recognize that. Don't doubt yourself. Surround yourself with people that will encourage you and support you because the working world is difficult. It is not the same as the university environment. You will be challenged with all the things we talked about here today, but you've got to persevere because you've earned the right to be there. And we need you in the industry. We need you, people like you in the industry so that these issues become less and less over time. So I, I'm encouraging you to just Go for it. I would just comment that if you're interviewing at a company where you feel that you're fulfilling a number, <coughs> that's not a company you want to work exactly. at. Exactly. You want to be somewhere else. But I think one thing I also I wanted to comment on is because I think this is a very common feeling that, and I, I don't think this is a com this is a feeling that's like exclusive to women, right? I think imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and the feeling of like, I need to prove myself and I probably need to do 10 times as much as I should be doing. Um, is a very common feeling for anybody starting a job, right? It's a terrifying moment. And you're thinking like, okay, where's this going? How am I gonna, you know, even figure all of this out, right? So I do think there is a thing though that, you know, as a woman, particularly if you go into a job environment where you have maybe predominantly men 
or this could also be, you know, just predominantly people who really just don't look like you, right? That you might feel like that even more. Um, and so I think, so this then runs a risk, a really real risk of you driving yourself to burnout, right? So I think what was just said, you deserve to be there. You don't actually have anything to prove and you definitely don't have more to prove than any other candidate. So I think one of the things that is really important in those early days is also try to figure out, well, how much is everybody else doing? Because it's gonna be very easy at the start to take on too much and to always say yes to everything because you feel like I need to prove myself. And so setting those boundaries actually while still doing an amazing job will earn you a lot of respect and will earn you your place and will make sure you don't stretch yourself too, too thin. Do we have, oh. There's another question over here, yeah. Um, this actually relates to imposter syndrome. I'm just up so you can see me. Um, so one of the topics that were spoken about was reaching out to campuses and schools, but what about encouraging existing women talent to gauge their interest in STEM fields as well? Um, this relates to imposter syndrome because um, how have you gotten over the imposter syndrome of getting into a STEM field? And what are the ways that we can encourage women within their current roles that, you know, they have transferable skills and it's not necessarily like hard to get into a STEM field, but there is this bias about you have to be really technical to get into it. So just wanted to ask for your experience in that. <laughs> no, no, no. Then somebody. I actually was going to bring up imposter syndrome yeah. for the young lady at the back who was who was talking about it, and and it came up. I even by some of your questions that you're asking, I think you have some of the answers in there, um, and it and it speaks to a lot of what was said already. That idea of really um, reminding yourself that you you've. you deserve to be there, but also seeking. This is how I handle imposter syndrome. Back when. I first started having it. I didn't even know that was a thing. I just thought it was just me. I just thought, uh, I knew that I earned my PhD, but I uh, I, I still had the syndrome. But um, seeking help when you um, need it, reminding yourself that you do belong there. But seeking help is important because there is there are going to be opportun there are going to be times where um, you are struggling, but that's okay because we all do. Um, I think everyone on this panel can yeah. give you an example of <laughs> trying something that did not work out so well at all, but we, we, we got back up. Um, and that's a, a very important skill. And I can tell you as a leader, when I hire, I don't ask people about all the great things they've done because lots of people who are applying aren't. I really spend most of the interview asking, give me examples of when you failed, give me examples of when you had to pivot, give me examples of all the sort of struggles that you had to deal with. So struggle is not necessarily a bad thing. So when you have that imposter syndrome, know that you have your strengths, know that you belong there, but know that you don't have to be perfect. So I think we, we go from thinking, oh shoot, I need to be perfect. Oh shoot, I don't belong here. And all these things just swirl in our heads. Another thing is sometimes um, we might make false assumptions of what other people think about us. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are gonna be the people who don't quite get it, but there might be the people who do um, really notice what you're doing. And um, and that goes back to your champions and your mentors and all of that. So um, it, it is a real thing, imposter syndrome is a real mm -hmm. thing, but we all, we all go through it and um, and this is why sometimes even having those people who aren't in your field as part of your champions and part of your team, they can give you that sort of arm's length advice as to how you can navigate some of these issues. I think even just the questions that you're asking are, are half the battle. You're way ahead of where I was um, decades ago. There's a great quote which I saw once, which, ne which was, um, never compare your own behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels. Mm -hmm. So you know what's going on in your head and you're comparing that with other people's highlight reels. And so I think really knowing yourself well and being really conscious that that's going on and all you're seeing is the highlight reels, you're not seeing what's going on in other people's heads, which is often the same thing, um, I think can be helpful. I don't think we spend nearly enough time in science and engineering teaching 
uh, metacognition, like really, um, you know, comfortable self-awareness, really knowing, you know, what our values are, that struggle is part of actually a skill set, but knowing how to fail and learn from failure is an incredible skill set, being able to articulate those things and then apply them in different settings. I think the interview you know, a, a much more effective interview approach, which is what you do, which is, is to ask about situational things. So I don't really care what the grades are. Tell me how you would manage a team where there was some conflict. What would you do if everything was late and Dr. Agard said for the deadline? You know, how would you do those things? And those are really the skills that you need to succeed, whether it's in science or engineering or a whole bunch of other fields. So, I mean, I think, um, I think, that there is, it can be very gendered, but we're hard on ourselves. That can be, uh, imposter syndrome is often an indication that the environment is not supportive and not inclusive. So if you're feeling, you know, a strong sense of imposter syndrome, like you said, it could be that those are the messages you're getting subtly. And so really being aware of like, what's going on here? And am I comparing my behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels? Is that what's going on? So that kind of really like, you know, um, strong kind of self-awareness and asking some of those questions can, can help kind of ground you, I think. Oh, one of, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? Really yes. one. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I found, you know, in, in my career, um, I, I think we all work with imposter syndrome, is reminding yourself of all the right things you've done. It, it's counterintuitive as women, especially. We don't want to take credit for anything. Oh, it was the team, it was that person that did it. But own it own the things that you've done. And, and I always say, have an elevator speech ready. You know, because you're gonna need it if you go to an interview. Someone's gonna ask you, what are, the, what are your top five accomplishments? You better know what they are. And don't shortchange yourself because a lot of women tend to shortchange. When I interview women, it's really fascinating. I'll have two candidates coming for a big job. The guy will just rhyme off a million things. I didn't even ask. They'll just wanna rhyme it. And if I dig two levels below, there's no substance. <laughs> the woman says, well, I don't really remember. Like, she's very hesitant. And then when I pull it out, there's like gold because she doubts herself and she's not giving the information that I'm looking for because she doubts herself. So you got to put doubt aside. You got to get your elevator speech ready. Figure out what those amazing things you've done and focus on that and not the one thing that you might have missed because we all miss all the time. We're just human. Just another point to also don't forget how a lot of the things that you do outside of your work and your career, those transferable skills apply as well. I, I remember once watching a panel and a woman who was interviewed for a high level position Apparently the interviewer was asking about her trip backpacking through Europe and how she had to survive because at the at that level everybody had a PhD everybody had you know years and years of corporate experience. She was just asked at the final exam to tell me about your backpacking trip. How did you make it through? So I always tell a lot of the young girls when I speak to them, you know, when I did sports or when I did various different things, some of those skills that I was developing are also very important. So don't underestimate how some of your outside experiences, the, those passions that, you're, you're, that you follow um, also are important in, your, um, in, in achieving your goals and, and developing your skills, which are probably even more memorable than you know, just talking about all of the different I don't know. <laughs> Give me something technical. Um, how well you, I don't know. How well you coded. That's yes, right. end there. There you I don't want to be in. Yeah. No, I don't want to be So I think that is the end of our time for this evening. So I'm going to turn it back over to Crystal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for such a thoughtful and very inspiring uh, conversation and thank you everyone for your questions as well. Um, you know our challenges are clear, but you know with the support of people in leadership and women in leadership like yourselves, and with the support of people in positions of power and privilege, I'm confident that uh, we can pave a better path forward for women in STEM. Uh, I also want to point out that although we are the ones leading this conversation, this isn't a woman's issue. 
it often gets lost in translation that because this problem impacts us, it's a woman's responsibility alone to fix it. The reality is that, yes, we do hold an important piece of the puzzle, but our male counterparts have the vital responsibility of allowing women to take up space in STEM. So that may look like at times stepping back so that women can lead. It may mean dampening their voices, not so that they can't be heard, but that so women's voices can be heard. It may also mean learning how to interact with their colleagues and changing the environment, as you mentioned, within their team or within their company. Um, so it, it, it may seem far-fetched, but I promise you it's not. And it may feel uncomfortable, but all change is uncomfortable. And with practice, it becomes natural. There was a lot about this conversation that resonated with my experience and being able to speak about these experiences is certainly a step in the right direction. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue this forward progress. So thank you so much. And let's all give another round of applause to all of our speakers and our moderator. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening and invite you all to stay, mingle, and enjoy a drink and some snacks just outside the atrium. So thank you so much. And enjoy your evening.